Good morning, church. Please turn your Bibles to Luke 18, verse 18. It's great to be back in Auckland. It's a beautiful city. I think it was Ian said every time I come, the sun shines, which I'm very happy about. Um, but it's great just to be here and see the church, see the church grow. They have a great Women's Day. The women did an incredible job yesterday. It was fantastic. Um, and it's great. I love rugby. I definitely was brought up playing rugby. There you go. So the title of today's sermon is, Are You a Fan of Jesus? You've got to milk something like the World Cup, right? I mean, you just, you've got to. Uh, I'm not sure if Jesus would have played rugby, but I think he may have been a good fullback. Who knows? Okay. Um, being a fan of a team can be really fun. It brings you a sense of purpose in life, even a whole way of life for some people. Yet there are different levels of fans. I think we all know that. There's the casual or the occasional fan. They have a team. And would not follow another, but they're pretty disinterested in that team. <laughs> if their team wins, great. If they lose, no big deal. So some people are just actually discovering they have a rugby team. Some days you go, oh, Russia has a rugby team. Oh, I didn't even know they had one. <laughs> or maybe Manibia. What? I didn't even know where Manibia is. It's like they're in the World Cup. What happened there? What is it? Namibia. <laughs> Namibia, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> then there's the definitive fan. He has a team. He knows when the season starts and when it finishes. Even keeps in touch with the scores, watches the games when he can. But his life does not evolve around the team. It's a small part of his life. He has it there, but it doesn't define him. Come on, Dad. <laughs> then there's the committed fan. Come on, some dog. He knows the team. He has the shirt. He knows who's been bought and who's sold all through the season. He has a strong opinion on the coach and the team and each player in the team. He gets upset when the team loses and goes wild when the team wins. To a large extent, his life revolves around this team. He goes to the matches weekly, and it costs him financially to be this type of fan, keeping up with the latest merchandise. You know, <clears throat> I love, we watched, I was trying to watch the rugby, but I, there's an advert out here, and um, it's very typical of New Zealand. So there's a guy in front of the telly, and he's a portly older guy, and he's watching the All Blacks, and he's going, mm, yeah, yeah, go, go, yeah. Yeah, he goes, it's like two minutes, and then he goes, some people don't get it, but we do. And it's, it's, it's just like, like, this is like, everybody in New Zealand knows the World Cup song, it's like the All Blacks. That's somebody who is really, and there's another one where he, I think that bit may be a shorter bit of the other one, where he's actually there, and he's got his girlfriend, and then she has to get involved, he marries her, and then there's the, uh, their children, and they're all watching it, and then their daughter brings in a boyfriend, and he has to, you know, support New Zealand like this and all that. But there's a real attitude of man. I am a seriously committed fan. I know what my life is about when it comes to this. How do we become fans? Well, fans often follow their father's teams, don't they? It's a family affair. <coughs> it's not a logical decision. It's an emotional decision. They don't necessarily pick the, the best team. But they're so connected because their family's connected. So not actually supporting that team is alien to them because they're like, that would break my relationships with my family. Why would I do that? Some, however, choose their team to be rebellious to this family because they want to be different. And we grow up in family sometimes and we, want, we don't want to be like our dad. And they're independent. This was me. So I'm from England. Now, my grandfather is Welsh, so they have a thing called the Six Nations, and if you are a rugby fan, that's a big deal over there. And so he's Welsh, so he would go for the Welsh. My dad was English, as am I, and would go for the English, and I went for France. I always grew up going for Jean-Pierre Reeve and France. Why? Because it wasn't my grandfather's, and it wasn't my dad's, and Scotland were no good, and England, uh, Ireland hardly existed at that time, so I went for the French, 
Jean-Pierre Reeve had blonde hair, he was phenomenal, he was a characteristic, but there was a part of me that I just want to be on an opposite team than my dad or my granddad. <laughs> Sometimes we can be that. Some choose a team that wins, or they think will win. See, some people today, they choose a team because they want to be associated with winners. You know, there are more supporters of Manchester United and Chelsea Soccer Club outside of England than there are in. And you meet somebody in the middle of India going, I support Manchester United. Why? They win. They win. No real loyalty, but we actually choose a team because we, it's something we want to become. And then there are some people, this is a new thing, I think. They no longer choose a team, they choose a player. This is particularly true in basketball. Yes. So people will follow Kobe Bryant, right? Yeah, or, or something like that because they move team. They, they don't care about the team. They just follow the player. There have even been people that followed Sonny Bill Williams to the All Blacks rather than from Samoa. But you see, that's a new thing. But why do we become fans? Well, people want to have a purpose. It makes it life more exciting. So why have we got a rugby campaign? We evangelise and we don't need to do that, but we just want some fun, don't we? Yeah. We're just like, let's, let's do it in a more fun way. Yeah. It gives us a chance to become something bigger than ourselves. It also allows us to live a fantasy life. It's amazing going to somewhere, I went to Samoa last week, and all of a sudden, everybody has a Sunny Bill haircut. <laughs> as if their Sunny Bill haircut makes them, they're all right. I'm possible like this. I'm just like Sonny Bill. You're nothing like Sonny Bill. You're two feet tall. But you're like, you know, I'm Sonny Bill. I'm Sonny Bill. Or the David Beckham haircut that... Who, where did that come from? I just squashed in the middle. I wake up in the morning like that. You don't have to be a thousand dollars haircut. Okay. It helps us build relationships. We meet people. A topic to talk about an identity. Now, how does that relate to Christianity? Well, I have two points today. My first point is this, fans go to hell. Fans go to hell. So we pick up in Luke 18, verse 18. It says, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at them and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This guy was a fan of Jesus, or of God. He knew who Jesus was, his reputation. He knew his role, they called him teacher. And his beliefs, the Old Testament, or so he thought. He was motivated. He had come to meet Jesus with express intention of asking him questions. He was deeply interested in knowing more about Jesus. He wanted to relate to Jesus. He even asked some relevant questions. You know, what, is it, what does it take to get to heaven? What was he saying to Jesus? He goes, you know, Jesus, I'm with you. We're on the same page, the same team. We believe in the same things. But he soon found out that there was a big difference between being a fan and a player. See, Jesus was not playing at being spiritual, at being godlike. He was God. Mm. Jesus was not a fan of God. He was God. Therefore, he did what God wanted him to do and everything God wanted him to do. So in John 14, 31, it says, The world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded. There was no difference in the commitment level between what God wanted Jesus to do and what he actually did. And this included giving up everything to focus on the mission of seeking and saving the lost, including all your wealth and worldly dreams. 
So in Luke 14, 33, it says, In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be, be my disciples. Jesus could have been one of the greatest businessmen in the world. I'm sure he could have been one of the greatest singers or entertainers in the world. Possibly even one of the, you know, greatest rugby players in the world. I mean, he could do miracles and you go, you know, just miss me. I mean, you know what I mean? He could have done some pretty amazing things. There are millions of more fans today than there are players of the game. You see, fans don't get injuries during a game or have to sit in ice baths after the game. If a team loses, there are no real consequences for them. They will not lose their job. They will not be rebuked or have to consider their future. Fans go to a game when it's convenient. They don't actually have to turn up every week. There's no accountability for a fan, none at all. Fans don't have to train, they can be lazy, overweight, rude, abusive, and their opinions mainly go unchallenged. Fans can even abuse their own players and coaches and get away with it. Fans can quit any time the going gets tough to be a fan. Fans can change loyalties to another team if they don't like the way the team plays. You know, today there are many churches and people who call themselves Christians who are really more fans of Jesus than actual players. You have those who know roughly about Jesus, but when you ask them to turn to a book like Philemon or Micah or Hezekiah, they go, where's that? Is it even in the Bible? They don't really know what's in the Bible. Their view is, is, you know, Jesus is white, blonde hair, blue eyes, flows like this and that. <laughs> that, that in other words, they, they grab it. It's like, how many things in the Bible do people think they know? You know, the three wise men at Christmas. There were no three wise men at Christmas. There were three gifts. I always love people go, when atheists come to you and they go, how can you figure out that when Noah had the ark, you know, he fit all those elephants and giraffes, and how could that happen? I go, you think they were adults that went into that ark, don't you? Yeah, everybody's seen the movie. What does it say in the Bible it was an adult? If I was filling up the ark, I'd have a baby tiger and a baby rhinoceros and a baby elephant. Why? Much more convenient. <laughs> but so much of what we believe is thrown at us. We go, that's in the Bible. I know it is. Really? Have you read the Bible? Come on. Most people who, are, who call themselves Christians have never read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Come on. Other people know the Bible somewhat, go to church somewhat, but when something more important comes up right. in their life, like family or job, their level of commitment is exposed for what it is. Yeah. We don't understand. My boss said I need to be at work on Wednesday night when there's church. Go, right? And? Well, I'll lose my job if I don't go. Yeah. And? Well, that's just unreasonable. To who? To your boss, to you, or to God? They're a fan of Jesus and the Christian life as long as it does not clash with the real values in life. And then there's the committed fan. They know the Bible a lot, are committed to church, go to all the meetings, games as it were. Yet when certain issues are brought up with them, they will not do it. This was a rich young ruler. Mm. Often this is the religious person that grows up in a church because they're basically used to the commitment. Why? Because their parents told them this is a commitment in life. It's like, Sunday we go to church, Wednesday we go to church, we do this, we do that. So it's actually not commitment to God, it's commitment to family culture. But then as soon as Jesus comes along, he goes, you know what? I know what you treasure most in life. Money for the rich and you Well, you know what? Education. You believe education is the bedrock of your future, not God. Right. That's one of the things growing up in my, at my age, which was a real disillusionment. You know, in the 1970s and 80s, people went, you need to have an, uh, a degree to succeed in life. That's no longer true. You can get a degree and still not got a job. It used to be almost like a degree guaranteed you a job. That is not true. It's not true anymore. That myth has flowed. And every generation has their myth. Mm. You know, if you do this, life will go well. Mm. That's not true. It's only if you follow God, life will go well. Come on. Now, false religion seems attractive, but it's the devil's way to destroy good-hearted people. I think there's an analogy about Eskimos and how they kill wolves. So wolves are very dangerous, and the Eskimos obviously don't have a lot, and, and wolves are very dangerous. 
And so the way they actually kill them is they get a seal and they get a knife and they dip their uh, knife in the seal blood and it freezes and then they dip it a bit more and 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 then they just put it in there like a seal blood lollipop on a stick. And a wolf smells the blood and goes, ooh, this is great. Comes along and starts licking this seal blood lollipop. And, you know, it tastes the blood and goes, oh, this is great, this is great, this is great. But as it keeps licking it, obviously it starts getting down to the blade. And so it starts licking the blade, not knowing that it's now its own blood that it's tasting rather than seal blood. And then the wolf at the end goes off and bleeds to death. So what seems like a free gift is the very thing that kills him. Mm -hmm. This is how Satan gets us. Right. He goes, you know, education is going to go great, you're going to feel great about yourself, you've got names after your, letters after your name, everything like this, and in the end it kills us. Who created this concept of parents teaching us, you know, you've got to have my life. And then you look at their marriage and go, well, you don't have a great marriage, yeah, but you need a house, you need a, a this and a that. None of those things in and of themselves are wrong. You go, that's not the answer. The answer is a relationship with God. Right. You go, well, family is, a, you know, in Samoa they go, family first or family forever. No, it's God. Why? Because unfortunately all of our family die. Mm. Yeah. That every single one of them dies. So they're not forever. Only God is forever. Come on. You know, today, are you a fan that thinks you're going to heaven? My second point is simply players go to heaven. Fans go to hell, and players go to heaven. In Luke 18, 26, it says, To those who heard this, so those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Mm. You know, the rich young ruler, he was exposed for being a fan of Jesus. But he didn't want to become a member of the actual team, a player, like the disciples that were following him. This even took the disciples aback, mm. that their coach had turned away a promising player due to his lack of character. You know, the truth of it is there have been many examples of teams that can't win, although they have the best players in the world on their team. Mm -hmm. LA Lakers in basketball, when they had all the greats there, couldn't win. I remember there was a Spanish team, I think it was Real Madrid, they had Beckham, Zidane and stuff. You know why? There were too many prima donnas. They just all wanted to score. When you all want to score, nobody can pass. When you don't pass, nobody scores. Right. Come on. And you got to see that Jesus knew that. There can be no independent disciples. People go, well, I've just got a personal relationship with God. And that is love God and love people. You can't love people if you don't hang out with people. Right. <laughs> you need a church. You go, I don't need church. No, you need a church to give to. Come on. How can you love God to other children if you don't go to a church? Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. You know, they realize that who could be chosen for God's team was very different when you actually listen to what God says. See, they would have chosen this guy. They'd go, man, he's a rich young ruler. We could use his money. I mean, Judas is stealing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? We could use his money. I mean, bring him on board. We could be full time forever. Have a nice, you know, a few houses down by Galilee. Lay, you know, nothing too expensive. And we'd be set for life, Jesus. He goes, I don't want his money. I want his heart. Come on. Many players who go on to try and be coaches never succeed because they lack true wisdom and true insight. Because they've never really played. Now what is the qualification for being a player on Jesus' team? You must be willing to play the game by the game's rules, not your own. You know, we find these in the Bible, not church doctrine or ministers' opinions. So it's amazing when people go, this is how we should do it. And you ask them, can you show me a scripture on that in the Bible? No, but I know it's true. Really? You're basing your life on something you know is true, but you can't point to it. 2 Timothy 2.5 says, Receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. What's well, amazing when you study the Bible, if you're visiting here today, we'll all ask you to study the Bible. I grew up in a super religious family. 
My mum's a minister in the Church of England, dad was church treasurer, my auntie's a Catholic, my sister was a charismatic missionary, my cousins are Jews, I had a mohawk, did drugs and went, you're all nuts. <laughs> Why? Because I looked at them and went, you, you don't even pray together. But what it was is, is they had so many opinions about what Christianity should be. The Catholic Church says, the Church of England says, the charismatic Church, and the Bible was never on the table. Right. Oh, they read it separately. There was never, let's put it in the middle and call ourselves to this standard. Come on. You know, you must be willing to go into strict spiritual training, live a sacrificial life, get hurt and injured in the process of helping your team, putting your body and life on the line for others. Sometimes these injuries stay with you for life. You know, you've got these rugby players when they're 16, they're like, hmm. I mean, they can't move. Darren Lockyer in Lee, he's got his whole jaw, his metal is just meshed together for the glory of the game. Mm. Sometimes, Christian, we get a little bit hurt by somebody, we go, ooh, wrong game. And I remember the first time I was introduced to basketball, they go, it's a non contact sport. <laughs> <laughs> I came off that, I was like, I am beaten up. What happened to the non contact sport? <laughs> we think being a Christian is a non contact sport. <laughs> Everybody else in the church is going to love this, it's going to be wonderful. It was rude to me. Oh, that's not Christianity. No, he's a sinner. Yeah. Christianity is resolving it. Come on, yeah. Resolving it. In 1 Corinthians 9 25, says, Anyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do not get a crown that will not last, but we do get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a box, boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified from my prize. Right. Some of you know, some of you don't know my friend Chi. I love Chi when I evangelize with him. This is Chi. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. He's done five hours already. He goes, man, five more hours. Right, ready to go. <laughs> That's how he motivates himself, because he's tired like everybody else, but he's like, let's go. In rugby, it's the same, they all get to go, and they're like, right, let's go. <laughs> you know, you don't see them when they get hit, go, oh, let me lie down there with you, bro. You're right, let me stroke your hair. <laughs> That's what we think in Christianity, I've got to hurt, oh, let me just, oh, I'll hug you and I'll love you. It's like, come on, get up, you big wuss. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross. People go, honestly, yeah. when I start the Bible, they go, I've got to give up my job. Okay. Let me put this to you very plainly. Jesus was flogged and died on the cross, giving up a job. <laughs> flogged on the cross, giving up. Would you like to swap with Jesus? At this point in time? <laughs> no, it's right, I'll give up my job. My parents are mean to me. The whole word flogging you? putting a crown on your head and you being butchered alive versus your family are a bit mean to you. Which one would you like today? And we, that's why we take communion. We lose perspective. Yeah. Yeah. We think Christianity is hard. Believe me, in this country, it is not hard. Yeah. It is not. Mm. We have Christians in countries where literally yeah. they die. Yeah. Our friends in India, in, in a place like Delhi and Chennai, Hindus take them, they take them around the corner, they get a hammer to their kneecaps, and they just start smashing their kneecaps for preaching the gospel. That's Christianity. That's real Christianity. You know, I know our, our preacher in Papua New Guinea, he um, would take the contribution, and he was kidnapped for the contribution. Oh my God. And uh, they said, they wrapped him up, took the contribution, put him in the, uh, an outhouse toilet, said, we'll be back and we'll kill you later. This was the minister. And somebody else happened to come and use the toilet and let him free and he ran for it. These are the countries we're going to. Believe me, what you're going to is not difficult. Standing up against your family or your culture. You know, you must learn to be a team player, not an independent individual. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. You know, our relationships are what convince the world. Mm -hmm. In the fact that we have Chinese, we have African, we have English, we have Australian, Puerto Rican, whatever it is, you know, there's that unity. You must be willing to be coached and take instruction and change. You know, it is really embarrassing to see somebody with talent that is not willing to be coached. Mm -hmm. 
You know, even in tennis, we have a guy in Australia, Nick Curios, refuses to get a coach. He's unbelievably talented. Even beat yeah. Rafa Nadal, I think he beat Federer once. Brilliant talent. He refuses to take a coach. Now, if Federer and Nadal will take a coach, mm. don't you think it would be a wise idea to take a coach? What I've really understood about every human being in life is, every human being is proud. We all hate being told what to do. I don't, there are only people that are proud and admit it, and people that are proud and don't. That's it. That's it. Who likes being told what to do? None of us. But then I realised, why is it we have such a problem? Why is it as it's from a teenager you get so rebellious? Well, I think God has made us inherently rebellious so that we can break away from our family. So you think about it, if you're brought up in a false religion, Hinduism, Atheism, Islam, how do you get the courage to break away from that to become a Christian? So God allows you when you're a teenager to go to this rebellious stage so that you have the opportunity to go, I am going to question everything I ever knew in my family. It's part of something God's given us. So he's allowed us to experience that and then only the word of God can tame that pride. It's the only thing. You look at the Bible and go, I think I'm right, but now I know I'm wrong. And then he gives us prayer to make our hearts soft. You go, you know what, even though I know that I am wrong, I don't want to tell them. Have you ever been in one of those fights? Mm. The second fight with Isabel, and I know she's right, well, particularly this happens with my wife, okay. <laughs> I know she's right, but I ain't telling her she's right. There's no way on this planet I'm going to tell her she's right. Because I just don't want her to be right. And we've all been in a fight like that. Every single one of us. We can get like that with God. The only problem is, is God is always right. Yeah. Yeah. You must be willing to work hard. One of the biggest things I think in life that we all have to accept is, why do some people succeed and other people don't? 99.9% right. .9 of the time it's hard work. Yeah. We want it to be everything else. Mm -hmm. And as a Christian we go, God doesn't love me. We start blaming God. God's mean, God doesn't love me. God loves you, I mean he gives us our sight. He goes, the problem is you. Yeah. That's just the reality. It's always been you, will always be you. God doesn't change. He's written it down. There's no extra bit of Bible. You know, you go sort of, okay, you go, you go, end of Bible, okay, Revelation. And then the book just written to Joe. Joe, it needs to be hardline for everybody else but you. It's okay. When you get to heaven, I'll be a bit softer on you. There is no extra book at the end of the Bible for me. Come on. You've got to be loyal. You must let your, not let your personal life affect your performance in the game. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing in Christian life how we go, you know what, you've got to understand I'm hurting. When a fireman goes to work, he doesn't go, you know what, I can't put out a fire, I've just had a fight with my wife. Sorry, I'll just take five minutes. Fire, a doctor can't, you go to a doctor and go, look, my foot's falling off. Yeah, but I've had a fight with my wife. You know, I'll get to it tomorrow. People don't do that. Where do we suddenly think that grace allowed us to suddenly just not be Christians. Come on. Yeah. You know, rewards for being a player as opposed to a fan. Well, you know what? Fans have to pay to see the game. Players get paid to turn up. Mm -hmm. They get rewarded for being a player. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why here it says, we will receive many times as much in this age. The truth of it is, what we get as Christians is this ability to handle life. So as uh, Kerry explained that uh, we bought this house, you know, we're trying to figure out a retirement, two bedroom apartment, okay, let's get this, great. By about six weeks, the whole thing starts falling down. Literally, 130 people out of the building, that's it. We're now gonna build for $60,000, etc. I mean, we just don't have the money, etc. God does not say you will avoid problems if you're a Christian. Yeah. He says, I'm gonna teach you how to handle them. Yeah. So it's been quite hilarious because I've been going back in and we're all happy, like we go, okay, God's in control, amen, not that I feel like that every day, but amen, God's in control, you know, all the Christians come and help me move out, we're like, hey, and everybody's like, I'm so happy. And all the Christians, they go, you know what, I've got this guy, they're trying to move out the house, they've got no relatives, can you help? I've got this guy, this lady, can you help? And all the Christians are going, it's an opportunity to preach the gospel. Right. You know, and then everybody was getting freaked out, and they were moving all their stuff out, we were moving our back in, they go, you're just nuts. I'm like, well... I've just got faith. Yeah. And then they said, you're, you're the happy old guy. And everybody who knows me is the happy old guy. I'm like, I like that. I'm like a happy old guy. 
So many people are, it's the end, they're struggling with depression, and then the building managers go, I need to give you some numbers so that people can call you, because their mental health is really going down. But you know what? I have a relationship with God, I have the church, I can express myself to God, to the church, I can get other people's comforting. People come up and say, hey, maybe I can help you out a bit, I couldn't do the whole lot. That's what you get in the kingdom. You get support. Right, yeah. Even family doesn't do that. You know what's hilarious about families? You can tick family off and they'll never speak to you again. Yeah, it's an amazing true. thing about family, isn't it? It's true. You go to a funeral and all of a sudden everybody, all the brothers and sisters, they love each other and then the parents and their will don't carve up the money as they think, never speak again in their entire life. Mm. So you see, the church is even better than that because we go, oh, Tyrone, you're fine with Sean, come in. The Bible says we need to be completely unified. Mm. And it's normally never like Sean's fault, Tara, and say you're both in sin, otherwise. Because it does take two people to fight, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if only one of them has attitudes, that's not a fight. That, that person's just got attitudes. I think about this, and I share this analogy all over the world. And I stole it, and I can't remember who gave it to me. Um, <laughs> but the difference between a Christian life and a non-Christian life is simply this. You are on a tandem bike with God. That, you are. Tandem bike is where two people sit on a, on a bicycle. A non-Christian is on the front of the bike and he's trying to direct their life. And God is on the back pedaling. Well, because God's powerful, man. You uh, are going some. Because you're trying to direct it, you keep crashing. So you go after this girl and that doesn't work out. And another girl and that doesn't work out. And another job. And you keep crashing because God keeps pushing you and you haven't got a clue where you're going. But you're free. There's no restrictions. I'll do whatever I want, whenever I want. A Christian swaps places. Oh no, he does the pedaling. Oh, it's much harder to resist sin as a Christian. Much, much harder. But then God directs you. He's on the front. And he'll take you places you never thought you would go. He'll take you up mountains and on paths or on his wide. You're pedaling like a God, really? Really? I've got to give this up? He goes, I'm in control. Just trust me, we'll come to this valley. It'll be fantastic. And you have to trust the guy on the front and you have to be focusing on righteousness in your relationship. I think we get special treatment. I was trying to, we have quite a lot of Chinese in our church. And the Chinese, I would say, they worship money. They're being fairly accurate. Why? Well, you've got to understand when you come from their society, there is no health care. Okay, there is no health care. So if you're real and you don't have money, they don't treat you. There are even some places in China where you have to proactively give blood to the hospital. If you get to hospital and you haven't, a new family hasn't given enough blood, they will not operate on you, no matter how bad it is. Yeah. So you can sort of guess what they are, but I was trying to explain to these guys, they say, you've got to understand that education and money don't get it done. Life is about who you know, not what you have. I said, it's like this. Uh, I use the analogy of this Chinese because I'm trying to convert the Chinese there. We've been very blessed to have about 20, 30 people that are Chinese there. And I said, okay, it's like this. You've graduated. Top of your class. Parents are fine. <laughs> and you've got this interview. That's a great job. And you go for the interview. And you've got your resume. And the resume looks pretty good. And you're in the, the interview lounge. And you're there with one other guy. Right? You have your suit on. This guy looks like he's from Samoa. You know what I mean? He's like got his flip-flops on. He's a bit chilled out. And... You know, maybe like Timothy didn't shave today, you know. <laughs> maybe Timothy's there, you know, and he's going up. He goes, you here for the job? Yeah, looks like it's just you and me. He goes, uh, do you have a degree? No. Do you have your resume with you? No. Chinese guy's like, fine. Goes in for the interview, there's one guy interviewing. And uh, the guy, you know, at the end, the Chinese guy goes, can I ask you a question? He said, do you think I'd do the job? I said, I think you're perfect for the job. I think you're ideal for the job. Everything on your resume, everything I'm impressed with you, you are fantastic. He goes, great, believes. And um, looks at the other guy, sneakers at him. Hello, <laughs> mate. Okay. The other guy just swanders in like this. And uh, the Chinese guy sort of holds back. The guy goes in for about a minute and a half and comes out. That's it. Anyway, go, they go home, and the Chinese guy gets a. Uh, Phone call says, I'm sorry, sir, but <clears throat> you didn't get the job. Can I ask you got it? He said, yeah, the other guy. There's only two good interview. It's like, what? He said, yeah. Hey, right, there's a phone now. The guy walks down the street just confused. And there's the guy. It's Timothy coming to it. 
said, yeah, Timothy, did you get the job? I said, yeah, no problem, got the job. Guess you have a degree? No. You take your resume? No. How come you got the job? He goes, well, you know the guy who's doing the interview? He goes, yeah, so that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> you see, life goes well for us as Christians because we have the right dad. Because it's the dad that holds the power. Education may help, but it's not the answer in life. Money may help, suit may help, all those things may help. But if you don't have a relationship with the right dad, your life is doomed. Doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter how educated, how good looking you are, life is about relationships. Yes. Always has been and always will be. You know, players get medals, crowns. You know, we have eternal life. In James 1, 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres on the trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We get the reward of heaven, eternal life. Players know the truth about the game. You know, so many people have an opinion about a game they've never played. So many people have an opinion about Christianity, but they, it's not true. Why, why do I know false religion lies because they don't know the truth only if you play the game do you know the truth so in john 8 31 it says to the jews who have believed him jesus said if you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free i've met so many religious people that go street evangelism doesn't work i get have you done it yeah i did it for a day I go, that's why you think it doesn't work yeah because you ain't doing it your prayer doesn't work do you pray every day? No. Well, that's why it doesn't work for you, mate. The yeah. Bible doesn't work. Do you put it in practice? No. That's why it doesn't work for you. So many people have an opinion on Christianity, and I go, do you do it? No. Even when I study with people from other religions, like Islam, Hinduism, I use their books with them. I go, Islam, do you obey the Quran? Then how on earth, if you don't, do you know it's true? You have no right to preach to me from that religion. You don't do it. You don't even know if it works. You just hope it works. Yeah. You just hope it works. You know, fans live a lie, an empty life. They never really experience the thrill of the game. Yeah. 1 John 2, 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. Mm. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Interesting point about the scripture says, if anyone obeys his words, love for God is truly made complete. Mm. Sometimes we feel like, I don't really feel like I love God. That's true. But we, try, we, we actually try and say it to get somebody to pat us on your back. Oh, there you do. There you go. It says the only way you love God and you'll really experience that love for God is if you obey his word. Yeah. So when we go, I don't feel like I love God, often the truth of it is you don't because you're not obeying. Come on. You're not really, you don't experience it like, with my wife, if I truly love her, if she tells me what to do and then I do that, then I feel close, she feels close to me and we get closer and closer and closer. But if she says, you know, honey, don't do this and I continue to do it, there's a barrier between us. There's like, she doesn't feel loved or respected. I know I, I, I should be doing it, so there's a guilt inside me. And there's just not this intimacy there. Mm. A lack of intimacy between you and God is because you really don't want to obey. Yeah. That's how you get to feel close. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the examples? Jesus and the apostles. Why do people not want to follow Jesus? Well, he got crucified, and people went, be like Jesus. Mm. Crucifixion was not a good thing. Yeah. All right. It was not something, but people want, you know what? It's going to be worth it. Yeah. I think sometimes people have a really wrong view of Jesus. Jesus' life, for the most part, was incredible. And then he had three bad days at the end. Mm. That is actually Christianity. <laughs> people go, oh, the cross, the cross, the cross. Yet he had the three bad days at the end. But the rest of the time, he was hanging out with his friends. And he would tell him, yeah, he got some persecution, but he hung out with his friends, etc. like that. Most of Christians, especially the West, we have a phenomenal time. Yeah. We have a few bad days. Honestly, some of us walk around like we're getting crucified every day and we have an occasionally good day. Mm. Yeah. That's not Christianity at all. Right. Right. So you have a few bumps to deal with. Get over it. There'll yeah. be a resurrection. That's pretty rough, but it's true. A fan never always sits on the terraces and never really does anything. Mm. They think they're a part of it, but really they're just part of a fantasy. And players go to heaven. 
My challenge to you today is, if you feel like and now understand that you're a fan, become a player. Leave your couch. Stop being a spiritual couch potato. Okay. All right. Study the Bible. Go into street training. Go, you know what? I need to start doing this. You know, I'm going to leave you with a quote that I like. It says, it would be a waste of your existence if you left this earth letting everybody use you but God. Wow. Amen. Wow.